did that deliberately. To yeah, to keep it more private so that people can post things that are personal and not have to feel the whole world's looking over their shoulder. <laughs> so uh, if you want to post some personal questions on the forum, which I recommend actually, it's better than writing me an email because that way everybody gets to benefit from the discussion. Uh, everybody can see. So we would much rather that you post your questions if you have extra questions on the forum. I don't always get to read all the forums on the courses. Now, um, somebody mentioned that they, there wasn't a forum, a discussion forum on the course. But I think we added a, it's called questions, comments, and feedback on the intro course. Now, uh, another comment that we got is the courses are changing. Yeah, we're adding things sometimes, uh, modifying things other times. The courses are a work in progress. Uh, it's more or less always going to be that way because as we gain more experience in dealing with students, we're going to see that a per certain parts of the course work better than others uh, or there's some things that all, pretty much all of the students are having trouble with and we need to rewrite that section and so on like that. So we're always going to be working on the courses. But because you have the key, you can always go back and check them and see if there's anything new or anything you missed. Like that. Whenever there's something updated, I tell the students about the new stuff so they can go back and take the benefit of that. That's a good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> so, cold. Anyway, material bodies, huh? Yeah, we all got it. Even Udava is getting a little sniffle. And he's always the last one to get sick because he's so fiery. <laughs> oh well. Um, so today's topic is more Vyabhachari Bhavas. Huh? Still more and more and more. <laughs> the same way we were doing last week, right? The ones that we were going to do last week. We'll do this week instead. Something happened last week. <laughs> there was a mutiny. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it was very nice that they want to celebrate this Vyas Puja. <coughs> we don't feel the need for all this stuff, you know, the ceremony and all this stuff. Um, it's like just the fact that the devotees are here and they're serving and they are doing such a nice job of learning devotional service, uh, that's enough for me, you know, that's, that, that's uh, uh, sufficient evidence of their devotion. <laughs> we don't need ceremonies and throwing flowers and all this stuff. If you want to do that, that's nice, but, you know, it's not so, not so much necessary. I think, you know, Krishna is in everybody's heart. He can see our devotion. He can see everything. Uh, so we don't need to so much uh, show externally. And when, the, when the focus is on Vaidhi Bhakti, maybe then everything has to be shown externally. Um, but when the focus is on Raga Nuga Bhakti, devotion, uh, spontaneous devotion, then it's not so much emphasis on showing or manifesting everything externally. You know? The feeling in the heart is enough. Uh, just like the story of the Sanodia Brahmana. I love this story. <laughs> I like to find an excuse to tell it. There was a Brahmana who was very poor. He didn't even have enough money to buy flowers and, and garlands and things like that, or what to speak of a deity, uh, or all the paraphernalia used to worship the deity. So, oh, thank you very much. Uh, but he very much wanted to worship the Lord in opulence. Uh, that was his mood. His mood was Vaikuntha, opulence. So one day he was sitting in the class on Srimad Bhagavatam and he heard that famous verse uh, from the uh, 11th canto. Krishna is speaking to Uddhava 
and he's saying that the deity can be made of different materials. It could be made of stone, wood, earth, uh, metal, paint, or it can be in the mind. And worship of any of those forms is as good as any other. So the Brahmin thought, ah, I can meditate on my devotional service instead of actually doing physically. And so he began to do this every day. He would go to a secluded spot on the bank of a river, sacred place, and uh, he would go into meditation and he would imagine the most opulent worship of the Lord. Uh, and he was doing everything, cooking, cleaning, uh, decorating the temple, dressing the deities, going on the altar, offering so many preparations and so many artiques and different kinds of worship, and all with the finest ingredients and the, you know, gold and uh, silver paraphernalia <coughs> and jewels and so forth. So he went on in this way for many years, quite happily. <laughs> and uh, one day, he was meditating on cooking sweet rice. So, you know, in sweet rice, there's a, there's a trick to sweet rice. Huh? Want me to tell you the trick? Yeah? Well, first of all, you have to use basmati rice. Of course. Basmati rice is really, though, it's too bad we can't get it here. I don't know. You know why they don't let you bring rice in to Chile? It's too good. Yeah, that's right. Their local rice here is very bland. It just doesn't have any flavor. You know? I guess we're spoiled. Anyway, you don't get any of those nice long grain varieties um, that we see up north. But anyway, you start with basmati rice. You take a little bit of ghee, just a tiny little bit of ghee, and you roast the basmati rice in the pan until it just changes color enough that you can see. You don't want to make it like brown, you know, but it just changes color a little bit. Huh? Then the proportion. The proportion has to be one part of rice to eight parts of milk. Very important. Yeah, everybody says that. Isn't that too much milk? Isn't it going to be like watery? No, no, trust me. <laughs> but the thing is, what you do is, you um, put the milk in with the rice, bring it to a boil, uh, and then you cook it down at least 30 or 40 percent. That means you have to boil it for maybe an hour. By that time, the rice starts to fall apart and it goes into the milk, and the milk also, because it evaporates, gets very thick. Okay, and then <laughs> he's lusting over it already. <laughs> so then uh, at the end, and you put in sugar or whatever sweetener you're going to use uh, after the milk cools a little bit, especially if you're using brown sugar or honey as a sweetener. Don't put it in while the milk is very hot. You can curdle the milk. We've had this happen with certain, kinds, certain types of brown sugar. Uh, you can actually curdle the milk. So wait till the milk cools down a bit and then put the sweetener in. And then... Very cool. Ready for the secret? Mm -hmm. A pinch of black pepper. Ew! You would never guess, would you? <sighs> you would never guess. That's the secret. That's the secret to like nectar falling off your chair, sweet rice. <laughs> yeah, Pishima showed me that. Who? Prabhupada's sister, Pishima. Oh, right. Yeah, she used to make it that, that way. Wow. Yeah. And you notice a big difference. Oh. Wow. Uh, it's like it's like the difference between ho hum sweet rice and wow nectar sweet rice. <laughs> it's mad quick. Well, you have to smuggle it into yeah. chili, right? Yeah, Kanai Das busted for smuggling 
hundred pounds of basmati rice and just really three years. <laughs> well, so anyway, the Brahmin was cooking sweet rice. And he was at the point of adding the sweetener. He wanted to make sure that the, the sweet rice had cooled enough. Huh? So he put his finger into the sweet rice. But it was still too hot. And it burned his finger. Huh? And broke his meditation. And he came out of his meditation. And he looked at his finger, and it was, to, it was actually burnt. <laughs> so at that moment, Lord Narayan in the Vaikuntha began to chuckle. You know, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and Lakshmi asks him, Oh my lord, what's so what's so amusing? He says, You'll see. And he immediately had a, sent a Vaikuntha airplane to go pick up 